and welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And today I'm joined by Aaron Ra, who needs no introduction, and uh, he was just taking care of some business real quick and fixing the dogs. And uh, yeah, Aaron Ra is here. He's no, he needs no introduction. Um, someone who I've always respected for a long time. Even when I was a Christian, I used to say, you know, that guy Aaron Ra is pretty freaking cool. I, I don't know. I just always felt that way. I don't know. I, I've heard people say, like, they can't I stand it. That you could say that as a, as a Christian, because what I get from most people is when they say, well, back when I was a Christian, I really hated you. Yeah, I've, I've seen people say that to you before. And, I'm, and I honestly always was like, that dude's badass. I remember just thinking uh, that. Like, uh, But maybe my path to Christianity is different than most. I wasn't born, born into it, indoctrinated. I became a Christian in prison when I was in my, when I hit rock bottom. So I was a different kind of edgy type of Christian anyway. So I'm looking at things differently anyway. So that might have been part of the reason why. But yeah, I've always uh I've always thought I've always respected you. So I've always loved to have you on. This is probably the third or fourth time you think you've been here, but we always have a good time and I always get a couple of videos ready to play and talk about. But before we react to some some cringe stuff, I want to start off with talking about the temple, the satanic temple. And so before I even ask you anything about this, we have a video from your channel, which, by the way, if anyone hasn't subscribed yet, obviously go do so. Um, you know, I'm, I would say a good amount of my my uh, watchers probably already are. But if you're not, go and do it. And uh, we're just going to play this video for a couple minutes and talk about it. So here we go. The go Satanic Temple is hosting a Satan Con in Scottsdale, and it is expected to set a record of being one of the largest Satanist gatherings. And hundreds of Christians swarmed outside the Saguaro Hotel. Signs like, Satan has no rights. Be gone, Satan. Because right behind them is the first ever Satanist convention. Satan Con will run today through Sunday. There will be speakers over the next couple of days. The event is sold out, as well as the Satanic Temple's right. Impurity Ball tonight at Pub Rock Live. <laughs> The devil has come to Scottsdale, sort of. All right, so I'm stoked to be speaking at the first ever convention of the Satanic, <laughs> and since this is our first convention, and since this is my coming out as Satanist, nice. Uh, I must open uh, not by speaking to the fine people assembled in this room, but to the larger audience of the tens and th tens of thousands that I expect to see this on video. I'm going to be talking about myself a little bit. This is a, much of this is anecdotal, what I'm going to be going over, but that can't be avoided. Uh, I only recently joined the Satanic Temple, and I held off for a number of reasons. One being that for me to be Satanist was too obvious. <laughs> Some Christians have accused me not only of worshiping Satan, but of being Satan. Nice. And a member of the Illuminati as well. Of course. I, I'm clearly the, uh, the lowest paid member. I'm still waiting on my checks. <laughs> and even some atheists complain that I look too much like Satan to represent them, but I've never seen a picture of Satan that looked like me. <laughs> Anton LaVey, maybe. I've seen pictures that look like him, not me. There's a slight difference in our appearance. But I get, I get that in the minds of the believers that truth matters less than appearances. But that's, that's why we're here, isn't it? Pushing the Overton window. And we've all seen more evil packed into one three-piece suit than in the entire audience at a black metal concert. And I've often said that I can't be satanic because I'm not young and sexy enough. <laughs> and because I can't afford the wardrobe because you all dress well. And even if I could fix that problem, that other one is just going to get worse. All right. So uh, tell us about this. I don't want uh, the people can go find the video on your channel. Just type in Aaron Ra. It comes right up and it's called Darwin and the Lord of Lies. It's a long video, but I just wanted to show, give a little taste of it. And uh, if anyone else is interested in watching that, they can check that out. Um, actually, I'll put it in the description after this video is over. Make it easier. Tell us about this. Uh, the T satanic the temple satanic temple and what it, what's the what is its purpose and what what is you, what are your thoughts on it what, and what is your purpose there as well well uh the satan con the first 
ever annual SatanCon was in Scottsdale, and I was keynote speaker of that event. And the next SatanCon is going to be in Boston, and I'll be there for that one as well. And I'm happy to say I'm not speaking there. I'm just socializing. Nice. Uh, and maybe going to go visit the uh, the headquarters for the Satanic Temple, which, of course, is located in Salem, Massachusetts, as you would expect. So the Church of Satan was founded by Anton LaVey in 1966, and it was founded as an atheist organization. So you can find people who say that they worship the devil. I mean, they're out there. I think there's 40 of them. <laughs> in the country you know and when uh, when they when they interviewed uh anton levey back in back when he started the satanic temple he says um he said well what do you what do you say to a theistic satanists people who believe that there is a god and they believe in the devil and he says there is no such thing satanists are all atheists that is not to say that atheists are satanists and it was a reason that i didn't join didn't i knew satanists back in the 80s but I never joined with the uh, with any of their their organizations for a number of reasons, but primarily being the the objection that you that, that you should be associated with devil worshippers, even though we don't worship anything, we don't believe there is a devil, that we should be associated with that simply because we don't believe in this other fairy tale. Why would we want to believe if we don't believe in your good guy? Why would we believe in your bad guy? <laughs> I see what you're saying. You know, right. I, I don't. I don't. Yeah, I don't get it. I. I don't believe in the force doesn't mean that I worship the Sith. It's yeah. just equally silly. Uh, however, uh, the Satanic Temple came along and they had a slightly different take. In 2013, uh, Lucian Greaves founded the Satanic Temple and they also are an atheist organization, but they're more activist. So mm. they are taking a more positive stand in defense of the First Amendment in ways that regular atheist organizations cannot do. Now, I would not personally define... Uh, any uh, satanic organization or atheist organization as a religion because a religion to me, by my definition, entails a belief in the supernatural, which Satanist organizations don't believe in the supernatural. So there you go. However, the U.S. government has no definition for religion and justices on the Supreme Court have gone so far as to say that they, they would consider ethical culture to be a religion that they consider humanism to be a religion you know and and things like that so, so things that don't meet any of the criteria of religion can be qualified as a religion by the federal government what this means is i'm on the board of directors for american atheists and when there is an issue of like putting up the 10 commandments and other religions might want to come up there and say, like, and this has happened, like in Oklahoma City, there was a number of different religions that vied to, if you're going to put up the Ten Commandments, then we, the Hindu temple of Oklahoma City, we get to put up our statue of Hanuman, the monkey god, right, or the mink, monkey king, right? So this is, this is what we're going to put up. And what impact does that have? It means that the Christians are going to laugh at the minority, and that's it. And when the atheists come up, you know, that's what happened once, I think it was in Florida, where the atheists wanted to put up their own thing too, and what do they have? They had a they had an homage to Carl Sagan. They had something about uh, astronomy, you know, stargazing. Which again, the Christians don't even get the point. Right, right. They don't, right. They don't even know what that is. I mean, they they don't understand how much of an affront to science their religion has been. They think they're the scientific ones, and that we're the ones who believe in magic. <laughs> Right, right. So they got everything turned around. So what happened was in Oklahoma City, when the, the Hindus wanted to put up Hanuman and some other group wanted to put up their their rendition, their their religious vision. You know, it, when the it, only when the Muslims do it do the Christians ever take notice. You know, when they want to do faith based schools, so they're intending that that's going to be for all Episcopalian schools or you know Methodist or or whatever. It's it's going to be some protestant denomination right they're not even going to tolerate catholic schools right. but then the muslims come up, yeah and the muslims come up and said okay well we get a faith-based school then too used based on tax dollars and all of a sudden oh wait 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 we're going to be we're, we're going to be funding tax you uh, tax dollars are going to fund muslim schools oh but we're supposed to be a secular country oh now you figure out what the fuck that means right so likewise, and now it works. For you. Now it's in your favor, right? Is yeah. It, yeah. So when works. they wanted to put up the Ten Commandments in Oklahoma City, here comes the Satanic Temple with their statue of Baphomet. Baphomet, 
with two children standing at his side. So goat head, all of that, you know, you know, making these symbol gestures and everything, and then just creeping the fuck out of the Christians. Well, we can't love- have that, <laughs> right? We can't have that because that's, well, we're a secular country unless we can, unless nobody notices. And then we can put up the Ten Commandments all we want to, like they did in Texas. They put up the Ten Commandments in Texas. And by the time somebody got around to saying, you know what, that's not actually that's against the Constitution, they decided to grandfather it in. They said, well, it's already been here for 45 years. Y'all should have said something before now. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so denied, right? Not you no know, kind of justification, but denied anyway. So I realized that the Satanic Temple can do more in defense of the First Amendment than regular atheist organizations can. And I wanted to celebrate first their defense of the First Amendment on things like like I was just talking about. But then when Texas, my beloved state, with our infamous governor, we just can't seem to get a good one. You know, we had we, we, we had W for a long time and then he was followed by Rick Perry, which is which is arguably more evil i mean a lot more evil than most other politicians I mean, but then you don't even know how evil rick perry was but then we got abbott can we get any worse i mean are they just going to start twirling their their mustaches oh wait i'm speaking out of turn here aren't i yeah <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when they started to pushing for uh, abortion to criminalize abortion in texas and the satanic temple comes up to to so th- use that was li- religious fourth, grounds. That was the force religious grounds. fighting against that was the satanic yes. temple. Interesting. And that was that was the gesture that made me say, you know what, the, the satanic temple needs more publicity. And if I can bring them that and and and, and thus aid in their efforts, then that's that's what I want to do. Uh, and I looked at their at the seven tenets. Now this is important. When you look at the seven tenets for the Satanic Temple, these are, I want to say, equivalent to the, the Ten Commandments, but they're only equivalent in the sense that, you know, the, the Ten Commandments are the the thing that the Christians hypocritically say are their codes of conduct, but that they don't follow them, and they don't even know what they are. But the seven tenets are slightly different. I mean, you, you, you're expected that you actually would follow these. As a matter yeah. of fact, I should probably have these up because I want to read them all out in order. I think I might have found them, but let me just just make sure these are the right ones because you know the internet you can find anything. Okay. Let's see, this might be them. Bam! Can you see that? Is it too small to read? Oh, I wasn't. No, I can't see it. There's nothing on the screen. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Uh, just, I'll just, just read them. them. Okay. Yeah. One number one. One should strive to act with compassion and empathy toward all creatures, according, accordance in accordance with reason. Yes. So, so okay. So we got the right ones there. Okay. Cool. Yeah, anything, and, anything. and already, already, right? What's the first commandment, right? Thou yeah. shalt have no other gods right. before right. me. It's some jealous thing happening off the bat. It's like, right. you're, so you're how insecure, yeah. how <laughs> insecure is this fucking God? Did you really create everything and yet you're this, you're this tentative, you're this skittish? What, what, are you really hiding behind a curtain? What is it you don't want us to think or know? What what, what the fuck are you so scared of, God? It's, it, you know, it's so fascinating how, the the 10 most important laws that the all-knowing creator can give to humans what is this wisdom what is it going to be is it going to be about space and time and and atoms and void nope it's about you shouldn't you should never cheat on me you should never yeah and then we get for me we get we get three commandments just talking about that three of them right three commandments to repeat the same thing it's so mind-blowing it's so and then oh here's here's a good one what's the fourth one Okay. Uh, it's, uh, honor thy father and thy mother, that thou shalt yeah. live a long life. Well, why, why does honoring your father and mother, which yeah, that sounds nice, right? Unless your father and mother don't don't earn that, right? There's a lot of a lot of parents don't. That's true. It's a lot of broken you homes know. out there. You, you should. Yeah, well, it's not just that they weren't. It's not just that they're broken homes. It's not just that mom and dad couldn't stay married. I mean, let's be, let's be real. Not, There's I'm a lot of really. That. I'm talking about really not, awful parents out there. Right. That, that don't deserve the honor. They that's haven't what, earned that's it. What I'm, that's what I'm referring to. Yeah. What I meant so that. why does the fourth commandment say that thou shalt, you know, honor thy father and thy mother, that thou will live a long life? Isn't that an inter- interesting phrase? Why is that? Hmm. You know why that is? Because uh, in Exodus 20, uh, 22, I think it is, there's a 
there's an edict and there's a law of Moses, one of the many that Moses brought down. It wasn't just Ten Commandments. He brought down all the laws and all the edicts. That's what it says. And one of them is that parents can have disobedient children murdered by law. They're right. disrespecting us. They're dishonoring us. We will go to the elders of the village and have the have our child stoned to death that he shall die. And it's happening. Oh, honor your father and mother so that they won't kill you and therefore you will live a long life. How is the Ten Commandments looking so far? Not so good over on their we're, side. We're only up to four and yeah. they're quite shit. Right. The, the very first one? But the first one on this side, you have one. You should strive to act with compassion and empathy towards all creatures in accordance yeah. with reason. By the way, that's important because the in, in this other in this other Judeo Christian religion, it's that humans are special and they're some sort of on a different level than other animals are. But like, we're really no. I've I've been saying this ever since I've uh, deconverted. Is that there, there's no reason that we should think that we're any more special than the ant that we accidentally stepped on. We're, we're just living creatures that are lucky to be this, um, this well-developed in our consciousness. We're just very, we hit the lottery in, in nature. We did. And so there, but, uh, but it doesn't make us on a, like more divine or more special than anything else. That also means that we have to show compassion for other animals, even if we have to eat them, because it is a net, it, part of our, sure. our biology. Not everyone can go to a vegan diet. It's not actually very healthy for most people. Right, right. I so agree. we are we are in a situation where we have to embrace our own hypocrisy. There are there are animals we have to eat or get products from. Sure. And there's no way around that. That's just what we maybe at some point we'll be able to manufacture all of our own food but industrially you know somehow. And and it won't have it won't have to take animal products. We can do it entirely agriculturally. You, I'm hoping for a day like that. But in the meantime, let's just try to be as ethical as we possibly can be. But you know what that highlights? It highlights how it highlights the the how the the absurdity of this unit this reality that we're in. That to survive, you have to eat another living being to keep surviving. And, and remember, there, there it really was like that. Creator. If there really was a creator who had a choice to do whatever he wanted. Why is that? The, why is that the way things had? Like that's just so messed up. If you think, yeah. When so you really think um, about that, when you really stop and think about that for a second, it's 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 it's. it's it, it says in the in the fable of the Garden of Eden, it says that you know, I will give you all this fruit that you may have for meat. Fruit that you may have for meat. Right. <laughs> So about that's that an part. interesting way to phrase that right at the opening of the story. Right. So, okay. So you have to eat, you have to ingest and digest other living things, living cells in order to survive. Interesting. So death is already in the world. It's already there. Yeah. It's yeah. just like by default, no one even thinks about it. Yeah. And then you've got the two trees, right? You've got the tree of the knowledge of, of, of good and evil, which is a ridiculous parable. Obviously it's a parable. It's, it's right. not, these are not trees that you could chop down and, you know, I saw this beautiful cartoon where they, they, Adam and Eve are sitting at this nice table with a with a, a cabinet next to them and chairs and everything, and God is pointing angrily at them, and then they said, we didn't eat of it. We made of it a dinette set. Right. <laughs> so we know it's not a tree. It's a parable, right? But what's the other tree? So God puts that one in. The Bible says it puts that one in the middle of the garden. Why did God put that in the middle of the fucking garden? Because it's a trap. And that's the bait and the trigger. Well, yeah, the bait is technically the serpent that God put there. Right. That's not Satan either, but we're getting into a whole lot of other stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so there, there's another tree, that, it, and it mentions right at the end of Genesis 3, it mentions what that other tree is all about. There's the tree of life. And God said that now that Adam and Eve had eaten of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, he had to get them out of the garden lest they eat from the true fruit of the tree of life. Because if they eat from the fruit of the tree of life, then they would live forever. It's like the secret. Well, form. that means they weren't going to live forever already, were they? Why would there be a tree of eternal life? Right. If they were already immortal. But try telling that to some diehard it Christian no creationist. It's so crazy when you think about it like that. You're right. It just absolutely makes no sense. And, um, and they're the ones that think they have the logic on their side. Right. Because, yeah, like especially the pre-sub types where it's this circular argument where 
my God is the all perfect idea. And it has to, everything has to be, be, be uh, reflected off of this thing. And so, but let's continue. I'm just going to read these off. And then yeah. I saw a couple super chats and we'll keep going. The, sure. sh- the next one is the struggle for justice is an ongoing and necessary pursuit that should prevail over laws and institutions. That's a really, see, this is, this is well thought out. This isn't just like, yay, no idols, no, no making idols. And uh, I'm going to use that. I'm going to say that three times in a row. And then uh, let's get into uh, other things like, uh, I don't know, like it's, this is like well thought out one next one is one's body is. Well, hold on. Hold on. Let's, let's discuss this one because there may be some misunderstanding when they say that justice should prevail over the law. There are some people that would take that to mean something like vigilante justice, but that's oh, yeah. not what the, that's not. That's actually what the what the what the far right people are doing. Right. That is not what the Satanic Temple is doing. The right. Satanic Temple is saying that laws can be unjust. Right. And when a law is unjust, then it needs to be corrected. And that applies especially to when when uh, they want to criminalize uh, women's reproductive yeah. rights, for example. That's that's an example of an unjust law. There are many others, like when uh, when homosexuality used to be a criminal offense. When when I was a child, when I was born, the marriage I currently have was illegal in this country. It was illegal for me, a white man, to be married to a woman who wasn't all white. Wow. Justice Clarence Thomas is in a marriage that was when he was my age, illegal. Wow. Well, not when he, when he, when he was young, man. The, the, yeah. the, his current marriage was illegal. No, but I get, I get the points, but it's not, it hasn't been that long, is the point. Yeah, 1967. Mind so mind. then, uh, number three, one's body is inviolable, subject to one's own will alone. That means you're going to hold, you're going to say that a, a child who is raped um doesn't have the 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 wherewithal to uh to re- to request an abortion but they 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 are they're going to be forced to carry to term when they're physically incapable of doing so this is just one of the many hypocrisies we see in our current system yeah instead of remember the sabbath day and keep it holy because because it's a special day. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like except that nobody remembers the Sabbath, do they? No, not the Christians. They they changed that to Sunday. Yeah. When did that happen? When when did the Bible authorize that? Yeah. Because it's supposed to be Friday night to Saturday it's night. It's not when even in the Bible. That's the that's what the did you throw in part? Sunday. That's the <laughs> part. It's not even in the Bible. Not even Paul even <laughs> says anything about that. They just did that later on and got away with it. And then Islam said, oh, we'll, we'll do ours on Monday or whatever. I think Monday, I think it is something something different, just to be different. You know, it's new religion, new day, obviously. You got to follow yeah. suit. You got to keep the, keep, the, keep the tradition going, change the day up. But uh, just to compare it, that's, I'm just throwing that out there to compare. We're talking about human rights. We're talking about being em- having empathy, compassion. And this one's like, make sure you put this day up on a pedestal. And you don't, you know, like, it's it's just like. This is the all wise. This is the all wise, all knowing. These are the laws we're supposed to follow. Anyways, the next one: <laughs> the freedoms of others should be respected, including the freedom to offend. I like yep. that. To willfully and unjustly encroach upon the freedoms of another is to forego one's own. Yes. Think about that. Oh, I can offend you. I can say anything I want to offend. But my right ends where your right begins. Yeah, I see what you're saying. It balances that. It balance. It keeps that balance there. So yeah, yeah, I get that. It's a very classical liberal idea, if you if you know what I mean. Like very freedom of speech, but also making sure every you know we're not being harming you know stuff like that. It's it's funny to me that the people who who shout most about being patriots. The people who identify as patriots, yeah, don't seem to know what patriotism is. No, uh, and and they're the ones that 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 shout the most about personal liberty, but if they and and they're the ones that hate the Satanists the most, right? When we we 
are the organization that, that, that is for personal liberty. Yeah. Not so much them. It's they so don't respect other people's rights. They just want their own privilege. Well, they want superior privilege. You, you get people talking about being free speech absolutist until it's something like, oh, we need to ban Satan books in the in the libraries because those are going to wait a minute. I thought you said you were a free speech absolutist. I thought you said yeah. you, were, you were, didn't want to gender people the way they, people want to be gender. I thought you want to have that freedom of speech. But you don't, you're afraid of a book in a library. You're going to ban and burn books, you fucking hypocrite. Right. <laughs> it's just, it's, the irony is so strong. It's not it, you can't even indeed can't stuff up. The next one. Is so going, then go, number uh, five. Beliefs, and this is important, beliefs should conform to one's best scientific understanding of the world. One should take care never to distort scientific facts to fit one's belief. Mm, reason. Keep that reason above above all else. I like yeah. that. That's important. And this, if, if for all the people that, that want to tell me that I'm, I'm secretly a devil worshiper... <laughs> Or, or that I'm in the I'm in the Illuminati. I've gotten that one. I've gotten that one a few times, or things along those lines that I'm a closet devil worshiper or whatever. I mean, or maybe I worship the state, even though I'm anti-authoritarian, which means I want less government than the GOP does. Right. Yeah. So what I've noticed is that my critics like to throw out all these things they hate. Um, you know, socialism and evolution and Satanism and communism and Marxism and what well, let me say what else? I mean, just a whole bunch of other words they don't know the meanings of. <laughs> the stuff they never read before. They're just they don't know what any of these things are. Just watch the Jordan video and, and they that's their edu that's the as far as their education goes. Yeah, I am not a communist. I'm not a Marxist. I'm not really even a socialist. I like social programs. I do want to put some restrictions and regulations on runaway capitalism because I think runaway capitalism, unfettered and unrestricted, is dangerous. And we're seeing that demonstrated regularly. But I am not I'm not any of the stereotypes that these people want to make me out to be. Right. Yeah. You, you want to take the next one? Sure. Number six is people are fallible. If one makes a mistake, one should do one's best to re rectify it and resolve any harm that might have been caused. Oh, well, look at that. You know, I wonder how many of these people on the far right, these Christian nationalists, bitch about cancel culture. <laughs> oh, and looky there. In the sixth commandment, we, from the supposed cancel culture group, are saying that hey, if you acknowledge a mistake and you're and you're trying to make amends, we should consider that toward forgiveness. Yeah, big deal. Yeah. Holy fuck! There's an idea, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> I like it. And, and and by the way, where do you get forgiveness? Genuine fucking forgiveness in the Ten Commandments. And you know what? So you, know you know what else is okay. ironic about that is you, they talk about these like free market types that are libertarian you know oh let, let the market run itself out the market's oh, yeah. always right well if the market worked you out and you got canceled because the market worked you out what about what where's the free market now what, what democracy is not where that, that's democracy working itself out so the, the whole cancel culture thing it's kind of a myth like i'm, I'm not going to say that sit there and say well, sometimes we go a little far with someone had a tweet from 10 years ago and then we get mad at the person for saying something 10 years ago i get that that's a little too much but at this but there's other people who legitimately do stupid shit and get canceled, and it's their fault. Period. That's just the way it is. So I just want to throw that out there. The last and one, number seven. Yeah, every tenant is a guiding principle designed to inspire nobility in action and thought. The spirit of compassion, wisdom, and justice should always prevail over the written or spoken word. That's a good one to end on, right there. Yeah. So be be better. Than the words you're reading, that's yeah. We other people are taught that the words that they're they're given are inviolable and and that they're infallible and that they're absolute truth and the revealed word of the one true God and they're, they're they are the law and you can't deviate from them even though everybody fucking does because they're all hypocrites. Right. They all they all mix you know cotton and linen. They all eat shrimp. They, <laughs> they all work on weekends, whichever day the fuck that is. Right. 
It's an yeah. interesting bunch of hypocrites. Uh, and, and importantly, the First Amendment contradicts the First Commandment. Right. And that's another thing is they, they keep talking about the Constitution is the Constitution is, Jude- is a Judeo-Christian document. No, it's not. It's if anything, it's Athenian dem- democratic from from the ancient uh, Athens or something that's been brought up and resurrected by by these uh, by these classical liberals like Jefferson, who, by the way, you have quotes from Jefferson. I think I actually have some loaded up. Let me know I don't where these people are completely uh very critical of Christianity. You got some of the some of the church fathers are are saying that Christianity needs to go. It's the opposite. I'm sure you've seen those quotes, right? I haven't seen those. I've seen, what I have seen is uh, I've seen a number of references that show that the the Constitution and the, the founding of the United States in general, our judicial system and all of that, our structure of government was based on uh, Greek democracy and also on John Locke and by uh, uh, Enlightenment thinkers, moreover, and when and there was a specific goal to be the very opposite yes. of the type of government that is normally associated with Moses. I'm going to blow your mind right now. Are you ready for this? Yes. I got two quotes from Jefferson that I want to show you. There's, it, there, it's not just Jefferson. It's, it's almost every church father, or not church father, founding father, minus a few that really were like they really were some Puritans in, in that room. But the majority of them were not. They were going along with the French movement of classical liberalism. Anyways, here's from Thomas Jefferson in 1814. The whole history of these books, the Gospels, is so defective and doubtful that it seems vain to attempt minute inquiry into it. And such tricks have been played with their texts and with the text of other books relating to them that we have a right from the, that cause to entertain much doubt what parts of them are genuine. In the New Testament, there is internal evidence that parts of it have proceeded from an extraordinary man and that the other parts are a fabric of very inferior minds. It is easy to separate those parts as to pick out diamonds from dunghills. This is even worse. I have examined all the known superstitions of the world, and I do not find in our particular superstition of Christianity one redeeming feature. They are all alike founded on fables and mythology. Yep. There's a lot. And there's, and there's from like 20 different, 20 different founding. There's so many, you can just Google founding fathers on Christianity. You'll find a lot of shit like this. The and, founder of the organization. that I should be surprised. Where in the constitution do you see anything about Christianity? Zero. No, not so, a bit. Nothing. Jesus. There weren't a whole lot of Christians among the, uh, the, among the founders. I mean, there were some, Yeah, there were some. but the few, the few that the Christians can point to many of them were Unitarian. They were, they, you know, our first Trinitarian Christian president was Andrew Jackson. Wow. Arguably also our worst. Yeah. Yeah. That's, 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 that's funny. Un- yeah. Yeah. He was, he was just, he was a horror show on wheels. Uh, it, it, he was so bad, but he, yeah, he was the first Trinitarian Christian. He, it, he, he brought about the, the trail of tears among yeah. other things, you know? So, but anyway, but prior to that Unitarians, People who believe that Jesus is not God, you know, they, they they were not into the Trinitarian aspect at all. So, and then there was quite a few of them that were deist, and some of those no that more, went yeah. to a Methodist church or identified as you know a Presbyterian or whatever were actually deists, and they were all Freemasons as well. Right. So, and, and, and yeah, and that's like exa- that's the point. There, were, these were uh, Enlightenment thinkers. And deism, it, like the um, what's his name, uh, Spinoza. The, these guys were were heavily borrowing from Spinoza, who was very critical of religion. That was the movement at the time. And I just want to, before we go to these super chat, I just got one more little little round of quotes before if anyone still doubts what we're saying. Uh, Jefferson again says Christianity neither is nor ever was a part of common law. Christianity is the most perverted system that ever shown on man. John Adams. The government of the United States is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. Thomas Paine. And that, that uh, statement was ratified by unanimous vote throughout Congress. Absolutely, as it should be. Thomas Paine says, All national institutions of churches, whether Jewish, Christian, or Turkish, appear to me no other 
than human invention set up to terrify and enslave mankind and monopolize power and profit. James Madison, religion and government will both exist in greater purity the less they are mixed together. Yep. That's yeah. So I, I gave testimony to the Texas State Board of Education when they wanted to teach that that the United States was founded on a covenant between God and Moses. And it's, I was accompanied by a handful of professors from different parts of the country who had also been flown in to give testimony to our board. But the problem is that we live in a time where the facts don't fucking matter. Right. The Board of Education knew that what they were teaching, what they were promoting was not actually factually true, but they have an agenda and they admitted there they were going to stick to it. They were going to promote American exceptionalism, whether it's true or not, because they believed that they said that it was important that students believe that the United States had certain blessings given by God because we follow his commandments. It's Plato's cave. It's... It's you. You born. You're born in Plato's cave, and you better stay there. You're better off there. That's a, that's that's their that's their philosophy behind it all. So, uh, Shireen, thank you for joining and becoming a member. I appreciate that. I really, really do. Gaius Julius Windex, thank you for the huge super chat. I appreciate that. And uh, thoughts on Satan being paganism incarnate. And believe it or not, this was actually the this was my conclusion. I did a video on Satan from the Old Testament, who's basically a district attorney in the Book of Job. He's not this all he's not this king of the underworld that people think of him today. He doesn't have horns. He's not a devil. Like he's none, none of that stuff happens. He's not the serpent. He's none of that stuff. But over time, as Christianity starts to rise, the idea of Satan becomes this grand opposition to God. He looks like Pan, the god Pan, who's the devil god. You know, he looks like actually I have a picture of Pan right here, by the way, just from the from one of my uh, never mind. No, I don't. You, you know, everyone knows what Pan looks like. He's got the horns. He's the goat god. So that's the image. He's the possessor. The god, Bacchus is the, the, god, the god who possesses. He's the underworld god. So he's like Hades. He's like Pluto, the underworld god. But he's also Lucifer. Who That's, that's Venus. So, like, you can just keep naming off gods and then say, hey, a lot of these traits are being applied to this Satan character. And so I, I already know guys, Judas Winnes is one of my Patreon members probably saw this video and wants to get your thoughts on that i was trying i actually sent you the video before but i knew i know you've been so busy you didn't have time to see it yet but yeah i don't know what do you think about that well i like the the, the list of quotes that you've read out and i'm i'm familiar with those as well i've seen how how we had satan uh the the, the devil character is a composition of all of these different other like you said it's a you know, part pan and part a number of other things but the thing that I find interesting is the devil is in in uh, in popular literature. The devil is always portrayed as someone who go, who lives by his word. Good point. Someone who, if you make a deal with the devil, he will honor when he loses that bet. Yeah. Every story, even in the de devil and Billy Markham, even there, uh, which I, I I forget who who wrote that, but it. In all of these depictions, uh, it when the when the devil goes down to Georgia to make the with the um, what is it the the fiddle bet or when they're at the crossroads when the old blues man is trying to save his soul back and they and they have to do the the guitar battle, you know it, the, the yeah. devil always honors his word. Isn't that so? Something? Why is this guy called the Lord of Lies? While God at the same time literally brags. lies, yeah. Literally, li literally lies, makes you believe in lies, makes you lie to yourself to continue believing. And all, then Our, God says, if the starts. prophet says that God says, if the prophet says something wrong, it's because I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. Yep. He said, I hardened Pharaoh's heart. And that's the whole reason why they have this whole, this whole Yom Kippur tradition of the Exodus and putting the lamb and all that stuff. Because Pharaoh, Pharaoh's heart was literally hardened by this guy. He did everything. He masterminded this whole thing. All the characters that did stuff that was wrong was because he made him do that. What? That's sadistic. It just, you don't need to be smart to realize that. You, you just read the text and you're like, what? <clears throat> you know? Indeed. And uh, oh, another thing I thought about, because I like this super chat a lot. Prometheus, this idea that there's a, there's a God who decides that 
He's going to rebel against the other, the stronger God and for, to help mankind and to give them now. Prometheus gives them fire, teaches them how to do technologies and all this. Um, he warns them about the flood. It's, it's Prometheus who warns the guy about the flood. Not, Zeus is going to flood everybody out and kill them. So you have those traits kind of being placed in there. You also have this idea of a fallen angel. There is no text about Lucifer falling. You have Isaiah, but Isaiah is not talking about a, a fallen angel scripture. He's talking about how great Venus is in the sky and the king of Babylon fell because he was so good like the, like, like the morning star. Morning star was a title of a, something something bright and good. And what happens is that myth, uh, John, uh, what is it, John, um, uh, P- Paradise Lost, um, Anyways, you have the story of the fallen Lucifer. That's like way later, and he's he's uh he's incorporating myths from like Apollo. There's a, there's a myth of Apollo getting in trouble, and Zeus kicks him out, sends him down to, uh, to Earth for a, a little short while of time. And Apollo is the beautiful god with who plays the harp, and he's the god of music and beauty. And you're like, wait a minute, this sounds a lot like the story that everyone tells later on about Lucifer. So that was part of my conclusion. It was like. When you're looking at Satan and all the stories about him and how he becomes the same thing as Lucifer, you're almost like, where do all these stories come from? They come from the pagan traditions, and pagan traditions are the evil traditions. That's the, that's Babylon. That's the, and so I think whether you are a pagan or you're an atheist, there's some there's something in common that's like this. This we have as like a, 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 an enemy in common i guess, i don't want to say enemy but you know you know what i mean there's like this well let's thing, put it this way. thing in common where you on one side you have this religion that wants you to submit to this this sadistic god and then there's the, everyone else just kind of wants to progress Does that makes sense let, yeah let me let me put it this way i mean i i mentioned before how i don't consider satanism to be a, a religion in the sense that it doesn't acknowledge the supernatural because i think that that religions would be, uh, they are all the proposal that a supernatural essence of self somehow survives the death of the physical body to continue on in some other form. But what the government is seeing, and this is valid, this is a valid definition of what a religion can be, is a, it's a system of ethics. So if Supreme Court justices would say that, you know, that ethical culture, whatever the hell that is, qualifies as a religion, then certainly a, a, an organization like the Satanic Temple that is based on ethics, very strong ethics, and I would argue superior to Christian ethics, then that qualifies as a religion in that say, in that case. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's more about, it's more about the, the ideas of opposition to other ideas that are harmful. Yeah. I've always said that that Satanism is humanism dressed up for a black metal concert. Nice. I like that. That's a good way to put it. <laughs> That's a great way to put it. Thank you for that super chat, Gaius. Appreciate that. Derek from Myth Vision Podcast. Thank you for the super chat. Aaron, what is the point of choosing to be under the umbrella of Satanism? Is that choice purposeful to oppose Christianity? Good question. Christianity, it, it Christianity is too broad a term. We're, we're going against Christian nationalism. Right. Sure. So we're going against, in some cases, literal Nazis. In some cases. I mean, Christian natural, nationalism is broader than that, but it does include that. Christian nationalism, in, in, it, it includes dominionists, people who want, you know, the, the, the president of the United States needs to be a Christian because he's going to be the most powerful being on earth and the most powerful being on earth must be a Christian because they're all dominionists and they want everybody else to bow to them. So, yeah, so we, we do have a common enemy there. Even other Christians should recognize that Christian dominionists are not in the Christian interest. They're, they're only interested in, in the power grab at everybody else's expense. So I have allies among Christians against Christian nationalists. Right. I've I've encountered allies who favor who who uh, who defend Satanism as a common ally against Christian nationalism. That makes a lot of sense. So, that's, that was, that's yeah, young Earth creationism, important. which is all lying to children for indoctrination. And for what? Why are they lying to the children? Why is it important that they make the children creationists so that they can make those children believe in? Uh, what was it that uh, American exceptionalism, which is another lie, 
that America is blessed only because we're religious, so that we can become more religious, so we can throw out everything that the founding fathers, that you were reading from the quotes of the founding fathers, they were warning us, do not let the religious people have commit, have control over the law because every time that has happened in history, the and result that, has always been a violation of human rights. Yep, absolutely, well said. Um, and then the, and the last thing I wanna say about that is a lot of these early Christians, and before when I was leaving Christianity, I, this, this is the reason for my name, my channel. I went to Gnosticism for a while. I still wasn't, I still believed in this, this biblical God in, in a sense. And I, but I, and I, I found out about Marcion. And this is guy who said, you know what? The old Testament God is not right. Mar and Marcion in the second century was pointing out that not only did the old Testament God not know where Adam was in the, in the garden, this is the arguments that we make today. He's saying this in the second century. He say he didn't know. He's not all knowing. He's saying, but he's also evil because he's he's letting his prophet Elijah send she bears to go kill some boys. He said, that's not the good God. That's not the monad. That's the demiurge. And the monad is the other God, and that's the good God. And so they actually were charged as being Satanists. If you look at the secret book of Mark, they're like, oh, these, these are Carpocratians and these Gnostics. They're learning the deep things of Satan. And I just think that I just think that's interesting how early on, early this very early on, this division was already happening, even within the religion itself. In the fourth century, the Luciferians were a Christian denomination. Yeah. I mean, that's that that's what that word means, light bringer, bringer of light. That's not it wasn't, it was never, it became this evil thing over time. Yeah, and it used to refer to Jesus. And Jesus, exactly. <laughs> Jesus calls himself the morning star. It's so it's so funny. Thanks for that super chat, Derek. Mr. Monster, thank you for the super chat. I'm proud that I can confidently admit that Satanism does not allow for slavery. By the way, it was fun watching you destroy at the debate, Aaron. Nice. Watching me destroy at the debate. I, I do a lot of debates. So Yeah, so which one is it? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Aren't you deb debating um t jump pretty soon yeah and i can't figure that out he, he's going to argue that, that the point is you know, does religion do more harm than good so we're yeah. both accepting that there is some placebo effect right that you know that, 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 that you, it's not impossible to gather a benefit from the lie of religion uh and and he's going to open he's going to admit at the forefront that there, there's are awful kinds of horrible stuff that's done in the name of religion so he's going to try to press a balance um and i think he just wants to see how good he is at arguing and can he that's how he is defend yeah. a defensible position that's how that's <laughs> what he jumped in he'll, he'll take any side of it just to do a debate i think but, yeah that's what i think he's doing and then some of his friends say you know that's what i think he's doing <laughs> yeah it sounds like it yeah but, um yeah so i'm gonna i just want to get some some uh some videos. So the first video that I wanted to present to you ha is, is a direct. It's from uh, what's his name? It's from where is it? Where did I put it? Oh, the devil gets to have all the fun. Okay, it's from Greg Locke, and you'll you'll understand why I'm playing it. We'll just play it right now. It's only a minute long. Okay. Did you know there are no such things as satanic cessationists? I just help myself, Wayne. Ain't nobody in a satanic church says, well, you know, I just, I just believe that all the miracles and wonders have ceased. I don't, I don't believe in power. No, 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 no. They're in it because of the power. And you got church people say, well, we believe in the power of God, but that was for another dispensation. So why is it the devil's crew gets to have power? And we don't. Why the devil get to have all the fun? We don't get no power. No, you don't get no power. You got to keep people sick. You got to keep people under demons. You got to keep people whatever filling the blank. And then the new age crew run around, astral projection, floating around, levitating, getting power, healing people supposedly, talking to spirits, prophesying through a spirit of divination. And then the church is like, oh, hey, well, uh, yes, we acknowledge they have power, but we are powerless. What? So in essence, let's just be honest about it, Skippy. Cessationists believe that the devil is bigger than Jesus. I'm about to do a moonwalk. 
He was beholding the miracles and signs which were done. That's what he wanted. Now I'm gonna prove it. All right, thoughts on that? Well, there weren't any. There weren't any thoughts in that. No, I know. Um, it's, it was. It's very hard to understand what he's even talking about. Well, he doesn't know. Right. I, mean, I, I don't. I, I'll, I'll confess my own ignorance. I don't know what a cessationist is. He, I think so. This is what I think he means. Because I honestly, I'm kind of iffy on this. He thing. doesn't want the states to to to, to separate from the union. <laughs> no, no, no. I think what he's saying is Satan cessationists, people who don't actually believe in the spirit of Satan, but they just are Satanists because they're atheists. He's saying that doesn't exist. They believe in the power of Satan. So he's basically calling out people like yourself, saying, "No, no, no, no. They don't believe in this." He's telling me that I don't exist. Saying that, yeah. He's basically saying you believe in Satan. You believe in the power. That you think it's real. He just, he's just, he's just, he's just saying it. Okay. Well, and I've already demonstrated otherwise. Right. But then, when has Greg Locke ever well, ever you know, expressed? Do I don't know why I wisdom. like this clip? the reason why I like this clip is because he's it's it's not that he's trying to bring you up to to say you believe as much as he believes. He kind of, in a way, is bringing himself down and saying we don't have any power, neither do they. Like it's almost like he's bringing himself down just by saying he's basically admitting that these ideas are just ideas. Does that make sense? I, I am running from the hypothesis now that believers, not all of them, of course, there are some who, who really do honestly believe this, which is sad, but there's a whole lot more that know on some level that this is all bullshit. And that they that they have to be pretending, and I, they have to be pretending because when you get into an argument with them, when there are, cer there are certain key things they can never admit, and they know they can never admit these things, they can never give ground on that point, and so they start telling lies to defend the faith. This tells me that they know that what they believe, what they make believe, is not really true. Yeah, that was kind of what I was getting at. Yeah. I just thought that was yeah. interesting how it because it kind of relates to what we're getting at. So I just wanted to get your thoughts. But yeah, that I agree. I agree hundred percent. That's pretty much what I was getting at. Here's another clip from Matt Hank Kuhneman talking about Joe Biden being replaced by a body double. This is a fun one. Somebody just texted me a picture of the the guy that they say is Biden. And I'm gonna be honest with you. Uh it doesn't look there's several pictures. It looks nothing like the guy that is Joe Biden. Now people say, oh, it's cosmetic surgery. I'm a cartoonist. <laughs> I also, uh, I also, and I'm being honest, I also uh, am a portrait artist and I recognize features and I can see features and what, what is, <laughs> I'm telling you, this is very interesting because November 4th of 2020, God said 46 doesn't exist. I remember that. And I had a dream on November 4th I was literally. Oh, well, that, that's going to be compelling. He had a dream. The election. Notice how his prophecy can't be wrong. Even though Biden won, the prophecy now just has to get reinterpreted. This is how Revelation has been has been stayed alive for 2,000 years. The prophecy yeah. can't be wrong. After the 1,000 years was up and Satan didn't come out of the ground, they had to reinterpret as Revelation. That meant 1,000 years later. Just wait another 1,000. Yeah. And so he's doing And there's people in my family who believe that Trump is still president. Right. 46 can't exist because I had a, I had a, I'm a prophet and I had a prophecy. So that means this is, it didn't mean that Trump was going to lose. It just meant that Biden's illegitimate. So we're still right. No matter what, we're right. All you got to do is reinterpret your prophecy and you're always right. I thought that I just, I, I, it's, it's the reason why I wanted to show this is because it's just classic Christian. This is just Christ. This is just Christianity. One on one. This is how you, this is how Christianity is. Done. He's a professional Christian right now. I don't even think he says anything else uh, important. Or this fake administration. Yeah, it's the same shit. And but uh, the super chat is, uh, to be fair, theistic Satanists exist, some of which are associated with neo-Nazism, like the joy of Satan ministries and the order of nine angels, etc. I don't know who those people are, but I don't doubt they exist. I just, uh, I'm assuming you, you, you have nothing to do with that, obviously. I've never heard. I of think them. I'm. You, I, I can see you. I saw the light in your screen look up as you're looking them up right now. So <laughs> obviously you don't know who they are either. No, I'm Vesper. I I, I bet you're right. 
people that take can take any idea. Like we were talking about how in the early Christians, you had Christians who thought Yahweh was evil. You had Christians who thought Yahweh was God the Father. You can, it doesn't matter what your core belief is. You can bend it in any way of this, any spectrum you want. There's always different sides to every coin. So I don't know. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's uh, I'm glad you pointed it out though. It's interesting. Something to look into, something to look up. Um, the next, I was just looking, I was just looking in your chat comments. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And if Aaron is devil, <laughs> you get that a lot. Yeah, I've always gotten that. I've gotten that since I was a child. So why not? Just, I was, why not just wear it and say, yeah, I'm a Satanist. <laughs> kinda. You know, it was a long time when I told people, I said, I can't be Satanist because it'd be too obvious. Right. Yeah. So that was a good clip. I mean, I've, been, I've been accused of being satanic my whole life. Right. I was, I was 11 and some woman uh, accused me. It was a beautiful way. She, she, you're a humanist. Um, I didn't know what a humanist was. I didn't think it was going to be a terrible insult. You know, um, I couldn't figure out what she was going on about, but she was angry that I was a humanist. And it was because I said things like first impressions are usually, are often wrong. I said, first impressions are often wrong because your first impression is based on uh, prior prejudice and, and, and a, a lack of, of quality information. So you're going to be judging somebody's you know, appearance or whatever. And there's lots of good reasons why they, why things could be different than you think they are. But I, I was arguing with people when I was a child and I'm from eight. The first time I brought this argument up, I was about eight and somebody jumped back on me saying that, that first impressions are never wrong because they're given to you by God. Which is crazy. Which is it is. Yeah. Yeah, but but how am I at eight years old going to correct an adult? Right. Yeah. You, you get, when you're young, when you're that young, you just think they know everything. You just think they have. No, no, I didn't think. I was in a. I was in a world full of stupid people. Oh, okay. I wanted to think that people knew, and I tried to give them the benefit of the doubt. Right. But they were so damn defensive. I mean, I asked one, and in, in on all honestly, when this woman told me how, how Jesus turned water into wine, I knew at eight that water was H2O. Every child knows that it's H2O, right? I didn't know what the chemical formula for fruit juice was or what the chemical formula for alcohol is. Turns out in both cases, it's just H2O adding carbons just in the right location. But I didn't know that then. I said, well, how did he turn two hydrogen atoms and an oxygen atom into whatever fruit juice and alcohol are? And she blew up at me. This is an adult yelling at me at eight years old. <laughs> how dare you question God? She, wow. Yeah, she's, she's furious because I sincerely want to know how did Jesus do this? Wow, that's and you. So you, 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 you had that skeptic. You just, you just had it. You just were born with it. That skeptic mindset. That's they correct. tried to, they tried to burn it out of me. I was taught to believe everything. They tried to burn it out of you? No way. They, well, they didn't, they didn't. They didn't. They weren't trying to burn me, but they were trying to. The way that I was raised, I was told to believe whatever the fuck I read. I was told that you believe what you're told because you were told to. And somehow that just that didn't work on me. I was told that that skeptics were cynics who missed out on the big picture that only believers can understand. And it took me the longest time to realize, oh, pretender. But believer means pretender. Make believe. Make believe, exactly. It literally is. It's, it's literally a, a state of mind, and you're aligning yourself. I thought about this as when I really, when I finally yeah. actually deconverted, I realized something. I realized that faith or being saved is an is is not really like knowledge or belief. It's it's basically you're aligning yourself. Like I'm choosing to align myself with the Bible, and hope in the hopes that if it's right, I'll I'll be eternally saved. You you don't really know. You can't tell yourself that something happened, that miracles happened that you've never seen in your lifetime that no one else has seen. There are that doesn't happen. Like you're basically just telling yourself that it happened, just in the hopes that it's true. That's what it is. That's why it's literally I'm believe. I'm having fun with the chat comments. Yeah, there's, there's some dumb there's statements in there. This why are we watching this video? It has nothing to do with Satanism. I gave the 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 origination of 
uh, Church of Satan and of the Satanic Temple. We read through the the the, uh, the the seven tenets of the Satanic Temple. We described why the organizations exist, both of them. But you, but somebody in your chat doesn't understand that that is about Satanism, right? Yeah, and 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 what what it is that we're actually opposed to. We are discussing all these things, right? Yeah, and just I don't know where your head's at. I don't know what you're watching, but uh, anyways, hi, welcome, thank you, for being <laughs> <laughs> James yeah. Afton. Ra, you had a lot of impact in my deconversion from Jehovah's Witnesses and Christianity in general. Thank you for all you do, the logic and reason you speak. I like that thumbnail. Thank you very much for that. It's a nice thumbnail. Yeah, thank you for that great super chat. So I got a couple more clips that we'll go through, just two or three okay. more. And they're, they're nice and short ones. And uh, so, yeah, here's from Jim Baker. <laughs> this guy is funny. Look at this headline. From Bloomberg, floods in California threatens to turn coastal California towns into an island. Hmm. Really? And he I, and look what Baja. he just said. He just said Baja would become an island. We're, we're watching. Really? He's a really? biblical proportion events that even the newscasters cannot get away from. Biblical proportion. And I'm not talking about your your typical Fox. I'm talking about <laughs> NBC, MSNBC. We're, we're faced with the reality that this revelation type of event- wait. You, you think he's about to say we're faced with the reality that there's a problem in the climate and there's things happening, but instead he takes it to the face with the reality that the Bible's right and all these events are supposed to happen. And that's why yeah. I wanted to show you this because I wanted to. I just wanted to hear your thoughts on how do you how do it's like first of all biblical proportions that means the world's ending. It doesn't mean there's a flood. Floods happen. But if you want to get into like the severity of this stuff, yeah, there's some truth to that because climate change is real. And now like, the problem is when we say big, biblical proportions, that's not really accurate because remember the tiny little circle. I'm sure a lot of people have seen the map. I'm sure that it says everything that ever happened in the Bible happened inside this circle. Right. You have that one little bit that includes, you know, from from Ramses to 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 Canaan and and little else beyond that. I mean, it's just this one little bitty thing out of the out of the whole map and because the bible and the bible the people who wrote the bible had no fucking clue that there was a western half of the world they didn't know most of the orient they, you know, they certainly didn't know about antarctica and things like that they have no idea so biblical proportions was actually a very small world in the minds of those people yeah a lot of these flood stories are probably from local flood stories like this particular they're, they're it probably was a Black Sea flood. Definitely, we 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 know yeah, that the Noah's danger. flood was that's was danger. based on. Th there's a bunch of uh, myths that came out well before the, the biblical version um, of this flood story, and they all, they give similar details, like all the important details, you know, like letting out the bird to find out when when the land is available and that that sort of thing. So we know that all these stories are related by these various details. Uh, one of the other details that keeps coming up is references to either Zeusudra himself, who is the Noah character in the original story, or the city in which the flood happened, because it wasn't the whole world. It was the city of Shropak. And in the Epic of, Atra Epic of Gilgamesh and the Epic of Atrahasis, and in a handful of these others, you, you find either reference to Zeusudra or you find reference to Shropak, or both, in all of these, so we know that there's a correlation to that event, and that's one that was identified by. Are you can you know you can Google it? You'll find it. But but uh, archaeologists had verified that there was a substantial flood of the Euphrates River in the city of Shuripak that that flooded to what depth? Can you guess? Let's just flip open the Bible and guess what the depth of the flood was: fifteen cubits, or twenty-two feet, which in a floodplain was enough to inundate everything right as there, there there were no tall buildings there were no high mountains there aren't even even significant trees right. <laughs> so yeah so, uh, it, and so we know where that story came from and and it's funny because that text even dates itself now i i've i've tried to i've tried to get this through to so many people no, i'm not I'm, I'm talking like young earth creationists who insists that the bible doesn't tell you when these floods happen doesn't give us a date no it does you all you 2900 bce there's enough data <laughs> there's enough data in the bible 
from let's take any two of the genealogy. It doesn't matter which one from Mar- Ma- uh, Matthew or Luke. You can use those. You could use the Book of Kings. The Book of Kings has a lot of uh, a lot of fat statements that say in the seventh year of X or in the tenth year of X. You can use all that stuff. You put it all on a map. You have enough data to pinpoint that this flood happened between 2300 and 2700 BCE, somewhere in the middle, depending on how liberal or how conservative you want to be. A little bit further, actually. The ar- archaeologists put it at 2900. 29. Okay. So let's say yeah, we'll it, most, most of the myths about it. Most of the myths. Most of the myths about it, though. Most of the myths about it, though, were, were dated to, to 2700, even though the archaeologists said, no, the flood actually happened in 29. Sure. So let's give them, let's give them an extra whatever, how many years. That's still, yeah. we still know from archaeology that the world was populated all over the continent at that time period. There was no restart of civilization at that time period. It's impossible. And that's, and that's let alone if there's even enough water to, to flood the whole earth. It's not even possible. So, so, like, so we're, we're so, talking about, it's so we're talking crazy. about, we're talking about you know, joining the satanic temple so that we can go against Christian nationalism, which is this huge threat, and, they, and the biblical literalists who are ruining the country. And so that means that we have to talk about what a ridiculous thing the Bible is. And then there's somebody over here who's who's bragging that they can't stop talking about the Bible. Yeah, because I love talk, talking I, I about talk missing. I love talking about Bible. Talk about missing the point of right. the whole exactly. conversation. Exactly. <laughs> that's the whole. By the way, that's the whole point of my channel. I, I do comparative mythology, ancient history, biblical studies. That's what that's what I do here. So I do a lot of that as well. Yeah, you yeah, don't. So you don't have to watch me. You can go some. Go watch Ken Ham. I don't care. You're the one that's here. <laughs> Once again, hi. <yeah. laughs> so we got two more videos, two more clips that I want to present. This is I've been having a good time so far. So hope everybody in the chat is as well. It's always fun to have yeah. it on here. This is the same guy from that clip. The hour in, we are in. Um, spiritual fathers, if you will, in my life um, that have affected me more than anyone else. Um, and that's Jim Baker and Chuck Missler. And Chuck Missler, here's a Jim quote Baker. from him that I feel quite aptly describes the world that we live in today. He says this, we have been plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period so in funny. human history. All right. That is so funny because if he's okay, he's obviously speaking about like revelation and how Jesus talks about how in the end days I'll come back and this was what's going to happen. And there's going to be great. Even we're though always, that prophecy that, was supposed no, to No, we're always in that place. times. We're always in that. Yeah, time. that That's the that whole prophecy point. was. That was supposed to have taken place while some, but not ago. all, some, but not all of Jesus's apostles were still alive, right? Some, but not all, because that's important, right? Because people want to come up with all these excuses. Well, they were only dead. They're only dead in the in the body. They're not dead in the spirit or whatever. That the hell bullshit excuse. No, if some of them are dead, if if some of them were supposed to be dead, but for you know by the time Jesus came back, then we know that it's happening in that generation and the the, the same the prophecy specifies that it was supposed to be in that generation, that it Jesus, was supposed to be very soon. The G, the yes. mouth of Jesus himself says, truly, I tell you, some of you who are standing here will not taste death before they see the son of man coming in his kingdom. Yeah. It's been 2000 years. I was just talking to a biblical scholar last week who says that in his professional opinion, he says that Jesus didn't think that he was the Messiah. He that Jesus thought that some other Messiah would come, and that you know that, that Jesus didn't personally believe that he was going to be executed and risen from the grave and all like that. But but that he's predicting somebody else. But of course, other people interpret it differently. And a number of what it comes down to ultimately, though, is it Jesus the the, the prophecy Jesus is making failed nineteen hundred years ago. Right, and and it gets even cr- and, and so and we're still sitting in the restaurant eating the breadsticks, waiting for him to show up. When are you going to so, admit you've been stood up? He ain't coming. Now. We've had if you go to there's a Wikipedia page. It's called Failed Apocalyptic Dates. There is two hundred of them, two hundred dates that have come and gone from between now between today and the first century. Two hundred 
failed. And I'm not just talking about some random guy's journal. We're talking about like head of bishops, we're talking about popes, we're talking about kings. We're talking about like real high, high up religious authority, authoritative figures that are saying this stuff. And so you got to remember that. And, and the thousand year reign was supposed to be when Satan came back. And when it didn't happen, everybody, the Pope Sylvester II in the year 1000 said, this is it, everybody. The Bible says that the thousand year reign is, is, is going to, is over and Satan's going to come out of the ground because he's, he's chained right now. And here, it, that time is up. They had to reinterpret that text into something else. Oh, it's 1237 now. The Mongols are coming. The Mongols are sweeping through the land. That's Gog and Magog. So no matter what time we're in, it's always the end times. So, so. Uh, Chuck Missler, dude. Of course, we're. It's always the end times. What are you talking? Okay, about? how are we supposed to recognize it? Is because there's going to be wars and rumors of wars, and there's going to be earthquakes, which is and, every day. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it was every day from the moment Jesus said that, and for quite a while prior to that time too. Right, and that's that's assuming Jesus said that because it's, it, I'm I'm talking to biblical scholars quite often, and and what I'm getting is well, the the anonymous people who wrote this say that Jesus said these things. <laughs> right. <laughs> that doesn't mean that Jesus said those things if there was a Jesus to say them. Right. Yeah, exactly. Good point. Um, Lee, Lee G, thank you for the super chat. Did you ever get a formal scholarly debate with Jason Burns? Is that for you? I never, Jason. Never yeah. Had. Jason oh. Burns was, uh, it, he, he, he was a, a sad character. Uh, who used to be active uh, YouTube years ago, lived out of Manchester, England, and he was one of those street preachers that he 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 gained some notoriety in uh, a, a decade or so ago when he used to argue with some of our with some friends of mine um, on back when they used to have blog TV. But uh, I haven't heard anything about Jason Burns in many years. So he, he just, you know, went back into obscurity. Oh, okay. Thanks for the super chat, though. Good question. I, I had no idea what you're talking about, but thank you for that. I appreciate that for helping support the show. I appreciate that. This is the last clip of the night. I've had, um, I wanted to end on this one because it's the funniest one. Okay. You're going to get a kick out of this one. You said you were going to share with us some good news, Michael. Yeah. And what I'm about to say, you may not understand right now. The people watching may not understand, but just file this away. And, and put okay. it in the back, put it up on a shelf, and then just come back to it later, okay? We watch Israel because I believe at some point, not tomorrow, but at some point, we are going to see an announcement regarding the Ark of the Covenant. The discovery of the Ark of the Covenant will be the greatest archaeological bombshell in all of human history. <laughs> now, the Ark of the Covenant has not been seen since 586 BC. The Babylonians came. They said they they besieged Jerusalem. You know what's interesting about that is that Book of Maccabees says that the Maccabees took the covenant, took the Ark of the Covenant, and brought it to Mount Sinai and buried it there. So, which one is it? Is it is it because the Maccabees would be in its 200s, 100s BCE, 187 BCE? But wait, you're saying 500? Which so we don't, we don't even know when the last time it was mentioned was. He's just throwing stuff out there. But um, no. Was, Wouldn't it be nice if there was th something like accountability? Like, what if we had a culture that demanded that you, when you say something, that you have to be able to show the truth of what you just said, or we're not going to believe you. Picks or it didn't happen. Right. Something right. along that kind of attitude. And when you when you make up statistics on the fly that we would recognize that you are talking out of your ass. Wouldn't it be nice to have a, a, a culture like that, that recognizes, Hey, you just said a bunch of shit. You can't possibly know. And you didn't put a, there's no expiration date on that prophecy. So there's never going to be a time when you can admit that you were wrong. You're obviously wrong. Now, why don't you shut the fuck up until you can show that you say, say something true. Right. And that's, I, that's the thing about um, a lot of these fundamentalist type of movements. It's not about, trying to be right or trying to find out what the truth is or let's let's do some studying and find out where it's about your your audience wants you to tell them what they already want to hear you have that power over your audience they're going to your church because they want to be told that this book is right so you have to just get creative and fit, figure out a way to make it sound correct it doesn't matter if it is or not you have that power over them it's a strong power to have they're coming to your church 
because they want to hear it. They want to hear that it's true. They already they already want it to be true. So no matter what, no matter what you say, you have that influence over them. That's what I mean by power. I don't mean like literally power. I mean like you have that influence over them. So that they want to be, they, they want you to tell them, tell them, tell me when it's going to happen. Oh, next year. Okay, great. That's what they want to hear. And so, you know, that's, that's the, that's the reality of these, of these, uh, of these cults, you know? And when you want to believe something, it, it obviously doesn't matter that it's true, right? But you, here's the difference in perspective for me that the important thing is that it's true. It's okay. If I don't believe something that turns out to be true. But what I want to avoid is I want to avoid believing things that are not true. I don't want to be fooled into believing something that is not evidently true. But believers do want to be fooled into believing things right. that are not true. Yep. And they want it so bad. And that was one of the last they'll... things that happened before I left my church was I had an, I had a dis disagreement about the King James Bible. And we'll end on this. And I said to uh, my, my friend, I was like, there's. I'm 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 doing research and I'm seeing that the King James Bible has a lot of flaws. It's adding verses from the 1600s. They're not found in any of the Greek manuscripts. And he goes, "Let's go to the pastor." I go, "All right, let's go to the pastor." We go to the pastor. The pastor just flat out lies to me. He says, "Don't listen to scholars. They're all being they're all they're all lying to you. The King James Bible is perfect." You know what my friend says? "See? See? Told you it's okay." He didn't care if he was right or not. He didn't check what the pastor said. He just heard the pastor tell him what we wanted to hear, and that was enough for him. And that's when I realized I was like, "This is this is not right." That was one of the last things. That was one of the last days I went to church. So, I, don't know. I had a similar experience that I went to church exactly one time in my <laughs> childhood, one time, uh, and I went on Easter Sunday, and I caught the guy. The guy was lying behind the podium. He said that there was a footprints. Uh, we, in, in a riverbed in Texas, there were human footprints walking with dinosaur footprints. And so that proves that there, there, were, there were dinosaurs in pre-Columbian times in North America because it was a Mormon church and they wanted to believe that the Garden of Eden was in Branson County, Missouri or whatever. And so I'm thinking, my 11-year-old self is thinking that the, the, they're talking about uh, Native Americans, pre-Columbian Native Americans are talking about, you know, what, is it possible that there were dinosaur footprint, that, were, that there were dinosaurs in North America that hadn't gone extinct by the time Columbus got here or how, how far? Because they said that they were that the footprints dated back 6,000 years. And I didn't realize that, of course, the guy's just lying about everything. Right. And he's talking about the, the human footprints, the man tracks that he was talking about were, in fact, dinosaur footprints that were misunderstood. I've been to the Paluxy River. I've seen the tracks for myself. I know exactly. You have three toed feet. And then when the, the foot dips into mud, the way it comes out, you can see that it makes a shape that is vaguely like a human footprint. But you can see where the seams are that went for where the mud closed back in over the toe holes when it came out. That's what that is. Wow. So, but I, what I recognized at the time was when the guy said that the sandaled, that they found sandaled footprints. And I'm thinking, well, Native Americans didn't wear sandals. They wore <laughs> moccasins. Right. Yeah. And so they wouldn't necessarily leave footprints, you know, recognizable footprints anyway. And, uh, but then he says, and that proves that those were Adam's footprints. Oh my God. I knew, I knew it. I was going to say there proves there were he Israelites or something because they had sandals, but you even went even worse. It's Adam. Of course, of course. So, yes. well, I'm, I'm 11 and I realized there's no way you could identify the owner of a pair of sandals or a pair of moccasins. <laughs> Did you, there's no way you could know. And I, and so when you're saying things, when you pretend to know things, you don't know, which is what all religions do. That's all religions do. Pretend to know things they don't know. Lie. Right. That's what that is. Pretending to know things you don't know is a lie. And so I, I leaned in. I, I said to my grandmother, I said, Grandma, he's lying. And she punched me in the gut. <laughs> of course. Because you do not question the man behind the podium. Right. That's the shepherd of the flock. Yeah. Good job. But um, anyways, this has been a great time, obviously. I always love having you on. If anyone out there hasn't, go and subscribe. I obviously have the bell on. I'm always watching your videos. Um, most of the people watching probably already are subscribed, but you never know. So I'll throw it out there. The link's in the description as well. 
And anything else you want to promote or anything coming out that you want to tell people about before we close out? Well, I'm going to be in Phoenix uh, in a few days for American Atheist National Convention. So if you can make it out to that, um, look forward to see you there. Uh, and of course, I'll be in Boston for SatanCon. And then the first weekend of May, I will be in Calgary, Canada for ReasonCon. And I'll also be on the 22nd, I'll be in Fort Worth for the debate that you mentioned with T-Jump. Nice. I'm looking forward to that. And uh, everybody, thank you for uh, the comments and stuff. And you have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. Oh.